What is your name, please? My name is Viola McMillan. My name is Viola McMillan. My name is Viola McMillan. All right, panel, once again, will you follow along with me as I read? I, Viola McMillan, am president of the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada. I am also an active mining prospector myself. I have been engaged in every phase of the business, from grub staking and swinging a pick to organizing and bringing the mines into production. Among my more successful strikes have been the Viola Mac mine in Porcupine, Ontario, the Lake Cinch, a uranium mine in Saskatchewan, and Windfall, a property in the Timmins area adjacent to the recent Texas Gulf Sulphur strike. Over the years, I have discovered and developed mines which up to now have produced over $40 million worth of ore. Signed, Viola Macmillan. <laughs> Find out now which of these ladies is the real mining prospector. Will the real Viola Macmillan please stand up? <laughs> June 1964, and Viola McMillan reigns as Queen Bee of Canadian mining. Ahead looms a trial named Windfall, but it has not yet dampened the fighting spirit. Well, all my lifetime, I felt that people should have guts. If they didn't have guts, they wouldn't get along in life. If, you, if one thing doesn't work, another one will. But keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. And something will happen to you. What happened to Viola happened through sheer strength of will. Born in D-Bank, Ontario, Violet Huggard was one of 15 children. From the start, she wanted one thing, an education. Her father, Thomas Huggard, had never been to school and never learned to read. The son of an Irish immigrant carpenter, he worked as a farmer. Her mother was a one-woman industry delivering mail, contracting herself out as a cleaner, and acting as the local midwife. In her day, she brought more than 200 babies into this world. Soon after Violet's birth in 1903, Thomas Huggard moved his family to a farm in Windermere in the Muskokas. Money was scarce, chores unending. Everyone was expected to pitch in, including young Violet. Well, I wasn't lazy. That's one thing I wasn't. I wasn't lazy. I was always wanting to do something. And there's no time to play. I didn't know what play was. And uh, we had to go to Sunday school on Sunday, and we had to not work, just do the chores, milk the cows, clear out the stables, and things like that. But once I got away from home, that was a different story. School offered an escape to the ambitious child, anxious to make something of herself. But school had its chores, too. Her mother had the contract to clean the building, and so Violet lit the fires every morning and cleaned up after the other young scholars had run home. While Violet was still a child, Joe, her favorite brother, set out to seek his fortune in the silver mines of cobalt. On his rare visits home, Joe would take his little sister on his knee and conjure up a magical, treasure-filled world deep beneath the earth. I, I remember him pointing to silver, and silver knives and forks and silver spoons and things like that, and you got that from mineral from underground. And I was fascinated by that, very fascinated by that. I had to see that mine someday when I grew up. I wanted to see that mine, and I did see it. I was going to be something someday. I don't know what I thought I was going to be, but I was going to be something. But soon, the dancing and music ceased as sounds of war shook the world. The older Huggard boys enlisted. At 12, Violet had to abandon school and her ambitions to help with the farm and the younger children.
With the war's end, Violet's brothers returned safely. But within months, Joe, her favorite, was dead of Spanish flu. He had been the only one to understand Violet. And her mother, if she had any ambition at all, it was for the boys. She always told Viola that there was no need for her to have an education, that, uh, that um, it would be wasted on her, that she would just, you know, get married and have children. And if she did ha need a job to fill in in the meantime, she could be a maid in the hotel nearby. She knew if I got my interest, I'd go away to business college or do something. And she didn't want me to leave home because they needed me at home. And I can understand that. Defying her mother, Violet returned to school to study for the entrance exam, which would qualify her for high school. The exam took place in June. She had three months to make up three years of missed work. At night, she studied secretly to avoid upsetting her mother. I would put pins on the curtains and the blinds on the windows just so that she couldn't see I was up at 2 o'clock in the morning studying. That June of 1919, Violet passed her exam. Changing her name from Violet, which she had never liked, to Viola, she headed to North Bay and a new life. Her plan was to live with a married sister and continue her education. But almost immediately, the plan faltered. Well, I was in North Bay just for two months when my father told me he couldn't give me any more money to go to business college. So I heard that there were jobs in Windsor. And so my sister gave me the money to go to Windsor, and uh, I went there and got a job with the Bell Telephone. After Bell came a job as a live-in maid. It seemed a far cry from her earlier dreams, but Viola scrimped and saved until she had made enough to pay her way through business college. On graduating, she became a secretary in the law office of her former employer, J.H. Rod. The years I was with Mr. Rod, I learned how to put agreements together. And so when I optioned properties and that, I, I knew what to say and what not to say. When she was 17, Viola had fallen in love. She had met him at a dance in Windsor, a tall young man with eyes that never stopped smiling. His name was George McMillan. Yes, he was a very handsome fellow. I thought I'd lose him many times because he's so good looking, but I figured if I lost him, well then, whoever got him got the worst of him, not the best. Then we got married in October of 1923, 1923. We had a very happy life. We had a very busy life. And um, he put up with me, and so we got along all right. Before her wedding, Viola visited Cobalt in memory of her brother Joe. She wanted to see the mine he had once described in vivid detail. And it was a holiday weekend, 1st of July, and there was just the, um, the manager was there and the uh, superintendent was there. And I coasted and coasted them to take me underground. They said, oh no, we can't take a girl underground. It's bad luck to take girls or women underground. We can't let you do that. And I said, well, Give me a cap and I look just like a boy in no time. Just give me the old clothes and I look like a boy in no time. And my hair was very short and I was determined to go underground. The captain took me underground and I was very excited about it. Took me down to the first level, 125 feet down. I went down in an electric cage. We would enter the drift and where the men had been working, taking ore out and they mine cars, so they'd throw the ore in, bring the mine cars up. It was damp down there, very damp down there. I thought it was a bad place for men to have to work underground in darkness and that, but um, it wasn't for very long, only eight hours, eight hours a day. He showed me how they took the ore up, and uh, at that time they had a mill, and uh, he showed me how they got the silver out of them, or. But I enjoyed being underground, and from that day on, I was in mining. Viola instantly began devouring books and pamphlets about the mining industry. Her career was launched. It was that unusual uh, <laughs> combination of a man and wife. She actually 
physically work and on claim staking, cutting the lines and harnessing the dogs for the dog team and stuff like that. They were actually in, literally in the bush year after year and uh, they slowly uh, built up and became uh, quite a famous, uh, quite a famous uh, prospecting couple. I always carried a compass with me and a pick. That would all be in my pack sack. Oh, I guess it weighed about 40 pounds. About 40 pounds. Up in Sussekinica, there was a prospector, and he had about 11 dogs. And he never washed any of his dishes. The dogs just licked the dishes all off clean. He wanted me to have a cup of coffee with him one day, and uh, he was going to make me a sandwich. I said, thank you. And I was starving hungry, but I said, no, no, I can't eat a thing. I'm just full right up. And that was a lie because I just wasn't going to eat off those plates. And I was scared to death of all these dogs that he had. They were absolutely, I know for a fact, dead broke at times when they were eking out a living trying to sell claims. We didn't have any money to buy sleeping bags in the early years, you know. We made sure we had lots of boughs to sleep on. Oh, we didn't worry about washing. We'd get enough, uh, enough water for tea and things like that. To go to the bathroom, we'd put a, a pole or two poles over two trees and sit on the one pole and put our feet on the other pole and sit there and do your job. Well, prospecting is, is no bed of roses. It's a tough, tough, game. There's more losers than winners. You actually dug the moss and the stumps and the trees and you opened a vein up and uh, sampled the vein. And uh, of course, if that was encouraging, then the next step would be diamond drilling. And that's, that was the exciting thing. That was big business. Exciting and costly a dangerous gamble. Yet it was plain to see that the owners of mining companies made more money than the prospectors who found the mines. In June 1933, Viola took that gamble. She formed Macmillan Securities, her own development company. The depression was at its height, but Viola had staked her shirt on success. Gradually, Viola's gamble paid off. She started making money arranging deals and selling share issues for companies trying to develop claims. But her big break came with some ground near Timmins. The first uh, property we had that was worth anything was a property called the Pooley Vet Lot. It had four claims, and um, it was in the syndicate, and I got the control of the syndicate. One winter, a man named Swallow arrived in Timmins, offering to make a deal. I said, oh, we didn't find a thing on that claim. We worked on it all summer long, we didn't find a thing. They said, well, we still like to option it. He was gonna leave on the train, and I was gonna make a deal with him for, in a couple of weeks' time. And I thought, no, why don't I make a deal today? Because it was a stormy, snowy day. So I rushed over to the hotel, and uh, I said, uh, if you got a fellow here by the name of Sparrow, he said, no, we don't have a Sparrow, but we have a Swallow. I said, that's him, where is he? They said, he's in the dining room. He's in the dining room, and he'd be going out on the train. So that he opened the door and let me in the dining room, and I said, say, we'll make a deal today. What do you want to give me for those claims? And I didn't know how, how much to ask him or anything. Well, he said, I'll give you $100 today. And I said, that's wonderful. So I pulled out a sheet of paper, and I put that down on paper. And um, he said, I'll give you 5000 on March the 1st. And I thought, oh, March the fir first deal I ever made. And March the 1st will come soon, and I'll have $5,000. Viola's claims had been bought by the huge Noranda Enterprise, which christened its new company, the Hallnor Mines. They started drilling the next day, and they went right into ore, and 16 drill holes out of 18 drill holes had free gold in the core, which was wonderful. And then it's paid $53 million in dividends, and uh, I've never been out of money ever since then. 
With the outbreak of World War II, the mining industry fell into a slump. New legislation seemed designed to discourage prospectors and investors alike. At the same time, certain strategic minerals were desperately needed to win the war. We were losing the war, and I wanted to know why we couldn't find some minerals in Canada that would help with the war effort. As secretary of a small group known as the Prospectors and Developers Association, Viola offered her services to the government. She was asked to encourage members to find new minerals, like tungsten, manganese, chromium. She saw at once that education was essential in this new field. Her response to this challenge to stimulate prospectors was to go to Ottawa to ask Dr. Young, uh, uh, chief geologist of the survey, uh, whether she could have some uh, senior geologist to give the classes and Dr. Young said how soon would you like these men to start and she looked out the window saw trees in bud and said immediately because you know once those leaves are in full bloom everybody will want to get into the field so we have a short time in which to get these classes done. I said how many people would I have to have present he said well if you had 15 or 20 prospectors it'd be worthwhile and I said oh I'll have more than that but I had about 150 or 200 people there. News of the success of the Toronto classes spread rapidly. From all over the province, requests poured in for the lectures to be repeated at regional centres. The following year, the program went national, educating hundreds of prospectors across the country. 1944 saw one of the greatest staking and early development booms in Canada's mining history, much of it owing to one woman's vision. By 1944, Viola McMillan had risen to the rank of president of the Prospectors and Developers Association. At the annual convention, a custom arose of greeting her appearance on the platform with a rousing chorus of, let me call you sweetheart. During her 21 years as president, membership would soar from a few hundred to over 4,000. Viola's influence on the PDA is rather like uh, jets on a, on a jet plane cutting in after the initial takeoff and the plane really took off. And that's what happened with the PDA. Well, she just put it on the map. That's what she's done. And it's now recognized by both the, all facets of government and mining. And it, it's made a real contribution to the industry. It's listened to. You know, she was the guiding genius. She was the energy. She pushed it. And she worked selflessly for it. The annual meetings were at the Royal York Hotel because it was the only hotel big enough at that time for our group of people. The conventions were very useful because it allowed for the dissemination, the sharing of technical knowledge, and uh, it allowed for the making of deals for prospectors to uh, seek uh, financing so that they could carry on and do their exploring, uh, for people with properties to sell them to uh, other interests. It's a great opportunity for students to get jobs for the summer and employers, of course, to look for good talent. Women didn't used to come, but I invited the women on the first anniversary I was there. I thought, and the, several men came in and tried to talk me out of having women. And I said, no, let's have them just once because I know all you men, but I don't know your wives. And just let the wives come once. And once we got them there, of course, we had them after that, always after that. It was wonderful. It does seem to me as if that Viola was regarded as just what she was called as at the time, the queen bee of Canadian mining. She was so visible. She was such a, a central part of this economic phenomenon of the, mine, of the Canadian mining boom. She had to develop something of a, of a hard and vague exterior in the business side of what she did. Uh, there was a, this vagueness that uh, I think is very characteristic of people uh, of that era. In the late 40s, the PDA turned its attention to Canada's struggling gold mines. Behind the scenes, Viola lobbied for improved conditions. She um, worked directly with ministers involved, federal ministers involved, to see an increase in the price of gold. Um, because the gold mines had been closed down, or largely closed down during the war years. 
By international agreement, the price of gold had been fixed at 35 US dollars per ounce. As costs rose after the war and the Canadian dollar climbed in value, the mining industry felt the pinch. The existence of whole communities across Canada was threatened. Viola soon recognized that the gold mines were in jeopardy, as did our whole industry. And she traveled uh, with, with colleagues to Ottawa many, many times over several years to develop with the federal government a program known as the Emergency Gold Mining Assistance Act, or EGMA. It bridged this widening gap between production costs and the value of gold. Without the implementation of the EGMA program, uh, unfortunately, mines would have closed. And of course, many northern communities would have been without any income, without wage earners. And so they would have become ghost towns. And Ontario would look dramatically different than it does today. Not just Ontario, but all of Canada. Things were changing in the mining world. The science of geophysics was on the rise and the lone prospector on his way out. Team effort and the expertise of geologists were the order of the day. Dr. Willis Ambrose, the Macmillan's new geological consultant, advised them to move to British Columbia to develop Viola Mac Mines, a property previously operated by an elderly eccentric, Ernest Doney. He sold me the property. It had been there for 19 years, talking to squirrels for 19 years. Doney had scraped a meager existence out of the lead mine, finding barely enough to subsist on. Using more sophisticated techniques, Viola struck pay dirt. Those were heady years for Viola McMillan. Constantly seeking to improve conditions for prospectors, she had successfully pushed for several new pieces of mining legislation. Her own fortunes had steadily increased, and now included Lake Cinch, a thriving uranium mine in Saskatchewan. But it's the story of how she gained control of a copper mine, the Kamkosha, which brings a glint to her eye more than 30 years later. Jules Timmons, who was the president of this Kamkosha property, Jules Timmons, an important man, you know, in mining. I asked him if I could buy it from him. And he said, no, he said, you can buy it from me if you tie up this prospector on the adjoining ground. And he said, if you, if you tie him up in the adjoining ground, he said, I'll, um, I'll sell you that. I said, how much you sell me that for? He said, I think 80,000, 80,000 cash and blah, 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 something. And I said, now that's the deal. But he said, you tie up this prospector on the other ground. So I tied up this other prospector but he called me. Everybody was trying to get this ground from him, even Frank Jubin. Everybody tried to get the ground. He wouldn't do business. So he called me up one morning about 7 o'clock. He said, well, are you going to be in Timmins tomorrow morning? I said, am I going to be in Timmins tomorrow morning? I said, yes, I am. It was this prospector. Such was old George Jameson's trust in Viola that he trudged 19 miles through the snow to sell her the claims which everyone wanted. And he uh, tapped on our bedroom door in the... In the in the hotel. I opened the door and it was him. And he said, and then he came in and he said, have you got the agreement ready? Have you got the agreement ready? I said, yes, but I'll get it ready. I'll get it ready right away. He knew I knew how to make an agreement. And so I um, got a piece of paper. Oh, I didn't have any white paper, just yellow copy paper. And we had to call in two of the maids to witness it because it was Sunday morning to witness the agreement. So Jules Timmons, the president of Hollinger, and he was away, I was trying to get him on the phone. He was away at church being Catholic, you know. So I thought, oh, well, I'll get him after he comes back from church. So after he back from church, I got him and said, Jules, I said, this is Viola. I'm in Timmins. And I said, do you remember you promised me that you'd let me have the Camp Kosher property if I tied up George Jameson on his other ground? He said, yes, I remember it well. Why? I said, well, I've just tied him up. And I said, do you want to hear the agreement? And he said, no, no, I'll take your word for it. Everybody always took my word for everything. So that's how I got the Camp Kosher. It seemed the childhood dreams had all come true, only to vanish. First came a major heart attack and instructions from her doctor to retire from the work she loved. Then followed a nightmare named Windfall. A huge find near Timmins by an American company 
triggered what Canadians came to call the windfall affair. I think it was 64 uh, when the Texas Gulf Sulphur Company discovered the Kid Creek, what's today the Kid Creek mine, in uh, Timmins and revived. Uh, Kid Creek, I guess, is probably the richest single mineral de known mineral deposit in the world in terms of its metallic content. The speculation that followed immediately on that was uh, it's unbelievable. There's never been ever uh, a boom like that in, in, in Canadian mining. The claim staking, the wheeling and dealing, the terrific all-time records on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Everybody was excited and making money and Viola could no more stay out of a situation, a boom like that, than fly to the moon. She'd had a serious health problem and had sold uh, when she recovered, she had sold uh, her interests, her production interests, to another mining organization and did not have any productive mines at the time. Uh, Windfall was uh, an attempt to come back and do it again. Viola's company, Windfall Oils and Mines, snapped up those claims which the Texas Gulf Sulphur Company had missed. So we started to drill, and before we got any of the results from the what we got in the drill hole. Everybody started running on our stock. And of course, the rumors were flooding all through Toronto and across Bay Street that, uh, hey, it looks like a jewelry store. Viola has, has hit something really magic. Well, they said I had manipulated the stock, and I didn't manipulate the stock. And I couldn't put gold in the core. I couldn't do that. I didn't even try to do that. But before we learned out whether we had any worthwhile, the people were paying the market. No press release, no statement, no nothing for, for I think something like two weeks until finally they had to announce that what they had was nothing and the stock went. The province set up a royal commission headed by Justice Arthur Kelly. Patrick Hart was his investigating counsel. Well, I, I was in charge of this investigation and I unfortunately concentrated on windfall and didn't put it, I don't think, into a proper uh, context at all. So that Viola was highlighted and uh, the full weight came down on Viola. In autumn 1965, Viola and George were charged with two counts of fraud. Almost four years would pass before their trial was over. They would be found not guilty on both counts. In the meantime, a charge of wash trading was made against Viola in relation to another company she owned, Consolidated Golden Arrow. Uh, wash trading is a is a, uh, uh, effectively where you trade with yourself, where you are both the buyer and the seller of the shares. The theory is that by you doing your own, buying and selling the same shares, you are creating a false impression of activity and supposedly manipulating the price. I think the fact that she was such a visible figure um, it didn't really have anything to do with her conviction, but it certainly may have had to do, had something to do with the vigor with which she was prosecuted. Maybe the authorities of the time wanted to make an example. She wasn't a criminal. Uh, she was in the tenor of her times. Everybody was doing what she was doing. And uh, you don't charge the head of the Securities Commission if you can charge some prospector. And the fact that the prospector was male, female, or hermaphrodite didn't matter. I didn't know what it was all about. I didn't know why they were so upset about things because um, I think some of the government officials were in on it too. But we didn't know that until after the trial was over with. But um, it's okay now. They were able to clean up a lot of things at the stock exchange. And um, it didn't put me in my grave. And what it did basically was uh, um, put in sensible regulations, forcing the Toronto Stock Exchange to police itself and beefing up the powers of the Ontario Securities Commission and kicking some of the more egregious promoters out of town, where, of course, they went to Vancouver. In March 1967, Viola was found guilty of wash trading and sentenced to a term of imprisonment not to exceed nine months. I think everybody should go to jail for one or two nights to realize what it's all about because uh, I was glad when uh, it was time to go to bed. Get away from the people. Get away from some of the characters that were in there. She would spend a total of nine weeks in prison, most of it at the Ontario Women's Guidance Centre in Brampton. 
Eleven years later, Viola received a full pardon for the wash trading offence from the Government of Canada. The shimmering treasures beneath the earth, described long ago by her brother Joe, had first sparked the young Viola's imagination. When one of the world's finest collection of minerals came on the market in 1989, Viola seized the chance to share those treasures with a new generation. Her donation pushed fundraising efforts over the top, enabling the Canadian Museum of Nature to acquire the Pinch Collection, a magnificent assembly of over 16,000 specimens. Oh, I thought the Pinch Collection was wonderful for Canada. I didn't want any other country to have it. And I knew someday, years ago, that something was going to happen to me in my lifetime. I said many times, I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I know children not yet born is going to hear about Valor McMillan. So maybe through the Pinch Collection, they will hear about it. As chairman of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame, uh, I thought that Viola should be one of our initial inductees. Uh, but there was some flat there, particularly one of our sponsors brought up the windfall fiasco, he called it. We put her at the head table, all men there, and, and uh, very top senior, very senior officials at the head table. And when I was introducing them, I asked the standard, please withhold any applause. And I came to Viola, and it was thunderous, just thunderous, the applause, that, which was out of order, really. The end result was that uh, she won nomination the third year. They applauded Viola because they loved her. In the days when it was unthinkable for women to go out and prospect in the bush and unthinkable to form companies and uh, set up directorships, she managed the financial side of it, she managed the administrative side of it. I think that she is truly uh, did something way ahead of her time in the days when it was not, women just didn't do that. They didn't even contemplate doing it. It was astonishing what she did. None of us want to get older. I'd like to turn back about 25 years. I know I'm not ready to leave this world yet. I gotta get rid of a lot of my junk. I'd like to be going out in the staking claims again in a gold rush because it's, it's really thrilling. <laughs>